Tonight, an election like nothing we've seen before. Residential garages and retirement homes don't make sense anymore for obvious reasons. More than just a race to the White House, the California candidates. We were able to get Republicans and Democrats to work together. I'm in agriculture. I'm 100% for more water storage. The issues. So it's very much like the state system where you have a governor and a state legislature. The community did not ask for this. It was put on the ballot at the last minute during a pandemic. The facts you need to make informed decisions. The flexibility and to do it independently is everything to us. It's nothing to do with flexibility. It's, it's, it's just misclassification. From all points of view all across Northern California. I wanted to come to a place where I know that once I put my ballot in there, it's going to the right place. This is a KCRA 3 Commitment 2020 special. Your November election voter guide. We are just 13 days from Election Day, and while attention centers on the presidential election, there is far more at stake this year. Thank you for joining us for this KCRA 3 Voter Guide Special. I'm Edie Lambert. And I'm Brian Heap. Your ballot may look the same as it has in years past, but how you vote and what this election will look like is not like any in history before. It's a November election like never before. For the first time, every California voter is receiving a mail-in ballot. There's really just no excuse for people not to vote, and I think we're seeing the fruits of that. In the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, a contentious presidential contest. Biden is a corrupt politician who shouldn't even be allowed to run for the presidency. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis has been unconscionable. The process of casting your ballot now different from before. All of that process, all of the equipment, everything is fundamentally changing. Moving from polling places to spacious voting centers in familiar places like the Golden One Center. Residential garages and retirement homes don't make sense anymore for obvious reasons. Voter turnout through the roof with less than two weeks until Election Day. And so I wanted to come to a place where I know that once I put my ballot in there, it's going to the right place. From a vice presidential race with California's Kamala Harris going against incumbent Mike Pence. I want to add, but if Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. To 12 congressional seats up for grabs. I stood consistently on founding principles of our country. I will reach across the aisle, pick up the phone, and call Republicans. And 12 propositions from rent control to the fate of independent contractors. Without Proposition 22, there's a very strong possibility that Lyft and Uber will have to shut down. We are employee and we need these benefits, especially in this pandemic. A year of firsts still to be seen from the state capital to the nation's capital. How California voters will handle this uncharted territory. And history is being made with this election with a record $200 million spent on a single ballot measure. You just heard a little bit of that debate. The measure is Prop 22. If passed, it would change employment rules for Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash drivers, along with many others. As KCRA 3 political reporter Mike Lurie shows us tonight, there are tens of millions of dollars at stake. Lyft driver Jan Kruger loves showing off her tattoo. It makes passengers very comfortable knowing mom's picking them up. Kruger has been driving for Lyft for seven years and supports Prop 22. In fact, you'll see her featured in the campaign's TV ads. App-based drivers like me are retirees, students, real estate agents. Prop 22 would allow gig drivers to be independent contractors and exempt them from Assembly Bill 5, a new law that reclassifies them as company employees. And now that I'm retired, uh, the last thing I want is a job. <laughs> I want to be able to continue to do it on my schedule. So it's very important. Our the flexibility and to do it independently is everything to us. Flexibility is also important to Akamine Kiari, a Sacramento State student who told us he's also eager to get extra benefits if Prop 22 passes. Prop 22 also does introduce um, some great benefits such as the health care stipend, something that we're not getting before. So that's great, the extra 30 cents a mile, that's also really nice. And uh, workman's, type, workman's compensation type of insurance, which is also great to have. Prop Prop 22 does pay for costs when a driver gets injured on the job, and it raises the minimum wage for each hour a driver spends driving. But opponents of Prop 22, including Uber and Lyft driver Hector Castellanos, believe rideshare drivers deserve greater protections that come with being a company employee. It's nothing to do with flexibility. It's, it's, it's just misclassification. We are employee and we 
need this benefit, especially in this pandemic. We need the representation uh, on this company so then we, we can keep fighting. Vote no on the deceptive Uber Lyft DoorDash Prop 22. One ride California doesn't want to take. The unions are actively fighting Prop 22. There is no flexibility when Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash can turn off your app in the drop of a hat. There's no flexibility when you need to take time off for a family member or for yourself and you're not provided paid sick leave. Prop 22 will have a direct impact on tens of thousands of gig workers and jobs in California, no matter who wins. In Sacramento, Mike Lurie, KCRA 3 News. Supporters of Prop 22 include the Chamber of Commerce and the California-Hawaii State Conference of the NAACP. Opponents include the California Teachers Association and the California Nurses Association. It is one of the hottest issues on the ballot, but often misunderstood. Now we're talking about Prop 15, which raises taxes for commercial land and buildings. But how will it affect you? Prop 15 promises the biggest change in property taxes in 40 years. The measure would raise up to $11.5 billion for schools and local governments by increasing the property taxes on commercial buildings that are worth more than $3 million. Commercial property would be taxed based on what the property is valued at today rather than its original purchase price. Supporters say this is a win for schools and communities, but opponents say small businesses and farmers will be hurt and they'll pass those costs back on to consumers. It'll help pay for libraries, uh, pay for recreation and parks. It'll pay for uh, social services for elder folks. Uh, it'll pay for homeless services. It's going to be used to meet the needs of families and communities, and I think that's very important. It's really the consumers that are going to end up paying uh, several hundred dollars more a year on average uh, for their food prices, because as everybody along the line takes those increases, uh, they're able to pass that on to the consumer, and that's going to be a very negative thing for so many families in California right now. The Yes campaign has raised more than $41 million so far with the California Teachers Association leading the way. The No campaign has raised nearly $34 million, most of that coming from business support groups. So if Prop 15 passes, it would take effect in 2022, but properties used by small businesses with 50 or fewer employees would see those changes happen in 2025. Californians will also decide the fate of Proposition 24. There is a new effort to change the law that gives consumers more control over the personal information that businesses can collect. KCRA3's Mike Desell explains how Prop 24 could impact your current privacy protections. Proposition 24 is focused on rewriting California's consumer privacy laws. It would create a whole new state agency and it comes with a twist regarding personal devices. So what does it do? Well, on the one hand, according to the Attorney General, Prop 24 would create the California Privacy Protection Agency to enforce new penalties for privacy violations involving consumers under the age of 16, allow civil penalties for theft of your login information, limit the use of sensitive personal information, allow you to direct businesses to correct your data, and prohibit businesses from keeping your information for, quote, longer than reasonably necessary. However, on the other hand, Prop 24 would change the criteria for which businesses must comply with the law, generally reduce the number of businesses that have to meet those requirements, and would increase the cost of the state budget at least $10 million a year to fund that new state agency. And then there's that one interesting impact. Prop 24 would no longer count devices which opponents say would mean the moment that you travel out of California, businesses can collect your personal information from those devices. Still, supporters say overall, Prop 24 would increase your consumer privacy protection. In Sacramento, Mike Tissell, KCRA 3 News. If approved, most of Prop 24's provisions would go into effect in 2023, but some, like the creation of a new state agency and the development of new regulations, would go into effect immediately. Now to Prop 20, which changes criminal sentencing and parole and rolls back some of the changes voters approved back in 2014 and 2016. Right now, crimes including car theft and credit card fraud are misdemeanors. Under Prop 20, people accused of these crimes could be charged with a felony. Prop 20 would 
require people with certain misdemeanors, including shoplifting, forgery, and illegal drug possession, to submit DNA samples. Prop 20 would also change rules for parole. It would require parole boards to consider a list of new factors when granting parole. Those would include age, mental condition, and job marketability. Supporters, including law enforcement agencies, argue that California needs to get tougher on criminal sentencing. Opponents, including Governor Newsom and the ACLU, say crime is down right now and there's no need to return to mass incarceration. Sacramento City voters will decide if they want to increase the mayor's powers. The measure A would allow the mayor to create a budget that would have to be approved by the city council. It would also give the mayor the power to direct the city manager, though the mayor would be limited to two terms. Measure A also contains provisions to require the city to examine the impacts of the budget and policies on social equity and small businesses. It would also establish an ethics commission and a new fair housing and human rights commission. And adopt a process to get the community input on certain budget items. Supporters of Measure A include Mayor Daryl Steinberg. They say it gives the mayor emergency powers and will create more accountability, but opponents, including the League of Women Voters, say this is a power grab. It's very much like the state system where you have a governor and a state legislature. One of the misnomers, I think, uh, from the opposition is that this somehow is a concentration of power in the mayor, just the opposite. It actually enhances the role of the city council. The city council will be its own legislative body. The community did not ask for this. It was put on the ballot at the last minute during a pandemic, a very difficult time for us, frankly, to talk to voters about this and a time when voters have a lot more to think about than uh, a serious change in the structure of the city government. Now to Placer County, where voters will decide if county elected officials need to live in the county. Measure I would require that. Right now, elected officials have to be registered to vote in the county at the time of their appointment, but they don't have to live there after that. Also in Placer County, voters in the city of Auburn will decide if they want to increase the sales tax to invest in better safety. Measure S would add a 1% sales tax, raising just over $2.5 million a year. That money would be used for fire, police, and code enforcement services. Those in favor say the city's police and fire departments have been underfunded since 2008, and the city's number one risk is a catastrophic fire similar to what the town of Paradise went through in 2018. Opponents say the tax would hurt small businesses and the money could actually be spent on anything, not just protective services. Now to Stanislaus County, where there are four measures to repair and modernize schools. And these measures are in the Salida Union, the Stanislaus Union, Waterford Unified, and Newman Crows Landing Unified School Districts. Measure Y is for the Stanislaus Union School District, and the district is asking to reauthorize an unused $21.4 million from a bond that was approved back in 2008. The money would be used to replace and repair outdated infrastructure and also provide better student access to internet and technology. Measure X is for the Newman Crows Landing School District and it's asking for $25.8 million in bonds for improvements. Measure U is for Salida Schools raising $9.34 million for upgrades. And also Measure T is for Waterford Union School District, $5.35 million for classrooms, campus safety, and technology. In San Joaquin County, there are measures to upgrade schools and tax cannabis operations. Let's start with Measure A. That would generate money for the Manteca Unified School District. The $260 million bond would upgrade classrooms, improve security, and upgrade facility systems. Measure X would add a 3.5% tax with an option to increase that to 8% on cannabis operations in the unincorporated parts of San Joaquin County. That money would be used for early childhood education, youth programs, homeless mitigation, and cannabis code enforcement. Measure W is also a cannabis tax, but just for the city of Tracy. That would take 6% of gross receipts from retailers and 4% from all other cannabis businesses. That money would help pay for core city services, including public safety, public works, parks, and community services. In Stockton, residents are voting for their next elected leader. The incumbent mayor, Michael Tubbs, will face off against a Republican challenger, Kevin Lincoln. Crime is a big issue in Stockton, and Mayor Tubbs says he has introduced some innovative programs to help reduce crime in Stockton. The challenger, Kevin Lincoln, is critical of the mayor's handling of crime.
programs like the Advanced Peace Program I'm very proud to have brought to Stockton, but also existing programs I've helped lead like Ceasefire and the Office of Violence Prevention have been paying dividends. So if you're gonna take credit for the crime reduction, you need to take responsibility and acknowledge you know, the crime that has increased. And whoever is elected as uh, to govern the city of Stockton uh, will do so at the Waterfront Towers, which is where the new city hall will be beginning next year. There is also a hotly contested race for the mayor of Elk Grove. KCRA 3's political reporter Mike Lurie shows us the political differences between these three candidates. As Elk Grove's mayor for the past four years, Steve Lee says he's helped improve the quality of life in this fast growing city. Probably the, the, the one that I'm most proud of is uh, bringing amenities into the city of Elk Grove. Uh, things like the Aquatic Center, uh, the Veterans Hall, uh, the Senior Center, the Community Center, Animal Shelter. Uh, these are things that I think it's important for the residents of the city of Elk Grove to have. Lee has two challengers in the mayor's race, including Elk Grove School District Trustee Bobby Singh Allen. I am running for mayor because we need change. We need strong leadership at City Hall. I am tired of seeing the infighting that is taking place between the mayor and city council. The other candidate running for mayor is Brian Pastor, a medical technician. Uh, I want to protect and promote small businesses. Uh, I want to have, you know, a safer community within Elk Grove. One of the biggest issues in Elk Grove is the plan by California North State University to build a teaching hospital adjacent to its campus, where neighbors have expressed concerns about traffic and congestion. Mayor Steve Lee has received thousands of dollars in campaign contributions from university officials. Campaign finance records show uh, they contributed roughly about $50,000, is that right? That's accurate, and um, you know, from the get-go, I've never uh, kept it a secret that I'm a big proponent of that. And I openly share the fact that my father died here in Elk Grove uh, because we couldn't get him to an ER fast enough and he died of a heart attack. Lee says he wants Elk Grove to have its own hospital, whether it's through California North State University or through Dignity Health, which has also unveiled plans for a new hospital in Elk Grove. But Lee's opponents are skeptical. My biggest concerns for that project is the lack of transparency in the leadership from the mayor. He's accepted over $50,000 in political contributions from not only the applicant, but uh, other associates within North State University. A big concern of our residents, not just in Stone Lake, but throughout Elk Grove, is traffic safety and transportation and congestion. We also asked Brian Pastor for his position on the hospital. I approve of the hospital, but of the location, I disapprove. There's a big environmental impact in putting a hospital adjacent to homes. In Elk Grove, Mike Lurie, KCRA 3 News. Two congressional seats being decided this November. What's at stake? And the candidates running for the House? That's next. And parolees at the ballot box. The proposition that would let a person with a felon conviction get their right to vote back quicker. The proposition that would let a person with a felony conviction get their right to vote back quicker.
And welcome back to our voter guide special as we continue to walk you through the ballot. Next up is Proposition 25. This would end California's money bail bond system. So the question is whether it would bring about criminal justice reform or is it just a get out of jail free card for criminals? KCRA 3's political reporter Mike Lurie shows us what's at stake. Michael Mendoza has a personal interest in eliminating cash bail. I know what it's like to be arrested for a crime and not be able to bail out because I couldn't afford to. Mendoza says he served 17 years for participating in a gang-related crime, but now he's working for the Anti-Recidivism Coalition and supporting Prop 25 to eliminate the bail system. And that is what our current money system does, is it criminalizes poverty and punishes the poor. A yes vote on 25 would get rid of the bail system as we know it today and allow a new state law to go into effect in which judges would decide if someone accused of serious crimes should be released or kept behind bars, depending on public safety and flight risk. Prop 25 requires an automatic release from jail for most misdemeanor crimes, but not felonies. And critics like Topo Padilla, president of the Golden State Bail Agents Association, estimates they could lose up to 7,000 jobs statewide if Prop 25 passes. We in the bail industry know what we do for the criminal justice system, and that is to give people their constitutional right to bail themselves out of jail should they be arrested. But supporters of Prop 25 accuse the bail bonds industry of profiting from people's misfortunes. Keeping someone in jail because they can't make bail means that you're setting people up to lose their, lose their job, lose their car, lose their homes, even their kids, even though they haven't been found guilty yet. Campaign finance records show the Yes on 25 campaign has collected more than $13.4 million, much of it from billionaire businessman John Arnold. By contrast, the No on 25 campaign has raised $7.2 million, much of it from the bail bonds industry. Whoever wins this very expensive campaign will likely change the lives of thousands of people currently in custody in California. In Sacramento, Mike Lurie, KCRA 3 News. Now let's take a look at Prop 17, which would allow people with felony convictions who are currently on parole to vote as soon as they're released from prison. So right now in California, people who are convicted of felonies are not allowed to vote until they've completed their parole. Supporters say this is about helping people rebuild their lives after they serve time behind bars. Opponents argue that people on parole are still serving their sentences and that parole helps to prepare them for fully returning to society, which then would include the right to vote again. The parole period is just a period of reintegration. Uh, we're working, we're paying taxes, and we're raising children, and we won't have access to say so for uh, stuff like uh, should we be allowed to vote for the Board of Education, which uh, when we have children. We look at parole as a very, very integral piece of rehabilitation and re reintegration into society and part of the entire um, term of someone's sentence, and it's our position that they should finish their complete term, which includes parole, um, before they get the right to vote back. The 16 other states and the District of Columbia already allow people to vote while on parole. Now we'll go to the congressional races and we'll start with District 4. This race is between the Republican incumbent Tom McClintock and Democratic challenger Bryn Kennedy. This is a sprawling district covering the foothills and Sierra from Auburn and Truckee to just east of Fresno. Representative Tom McClintock is a 12-year veteran of Washington, and he served in state politics before that. His key issue is forest management. He helped pass a law that streamlined the clearing of dead trees in the Tahoe Basin. Democrat Bryn Kennedy is a small business owner who calls herself a moderate Democrat. Health care is one of her top priorities. And turning out to the race for California's 10th congressional district. This district covers Stanislaus and parts of San Joaquin counties in the Central Valley. It also includes the cities of Modesto, Turkey, Lock and Patterson, and the race is between the Democratic incumbent Congressman Josh Harder and Republican challenger Ted Howes. Harder says his focus is building a consensus between Democrats and Republicans, while Social Security and Medicare are the top issues for the challenger Howes. The battle for, Cong for control of Congress rather goes right through Sacramento County. Here's a look at the heated contest for Congressional District 7, which covers a wide area from Elk Grove all the way to Rancho Cordova and Folsom. Voters are choosing either Democrat Ami Berra or Republican Buzz Patterson. Ami Berra is the incumbent and he served in Congress for eight years. His challenger, Buzz Patterson, is an Air Force veteran. We'll be right back.
Thank you for joining us for this Commitment 2020 Voter Guide Special. And we also have a detailed voter guide for you on our KCRA app and the KCRA3 website. Have a great night.